Okay, everybody, let's get started. So, I anticipate that we will probably not finish chapter four today, which means like last time, probably the first half hour or so of test review day, we'll go to wrapping up chapter four. Uh, so we didn't quite get to finishing behavioral genetics uh, last class, but we got pretty close. So I'll start by wrapping that up, and then we will move on to uh, evolutionary psychology. But first, on a lighter note, how many of you have been to the posters in Sub? There's a bunch of posters for sale. I saw one that caught my attention. Well, I took a picture this morning. Pink Floyd, the dark side of your mom. I have no point to make with this, I just thought it was nice. Okay, so let's get back into uh, chapter four. So we finished with uh, the three laws of behavior genetics from Eric Turkheimer. You don't need to know his name, uh, but you should know what each of the laws are. And I'll say a bit about each of them just to kind of give you an easy way to remember what each law means. So for the first law, namely that everything is heritable, typically 40 to 50%, uh, with some exceptions that we talked about, the easiest way to remember that is the twins reared apart studies. What this means is uh, twins reared apart will be highly similar, around 40 to 50% of the variation. For the second one, uh, namely that the shared environment typically explains less than genes. Shared environment meaning uh, the environment that you share with siblings. The easiest way to remember that is to think about adoptive siblings. So they share all of the shared environment, but none of their genes. Right? These are kids who are adopted into the same family, uh, but do not have the, uh, biological parents in common. And they are typically, especially in adulthood, not very similar. That's kind of an easy way to remember what that one means. And for the last one, namely that the non-shared environment, or as the book sometimes calls it, the unique environment, explains quite a bit, is uh, the following fact. Identical twins raised together are not 100% similar, right, for any trait. Typically there's a decent amount of a difference for traits that we can measure. And the only thing that's left that can explain why identical twins are different if they're raised together is the last bucket, right? The type, the aspects of the environment uh, that even siblings don't share. So that's an easy way to remember what that one is getting at. Now, I forget which I call in the, no in the notes, uh, if I call it the four laws or the three laws, but people have added uh, a fourth law. It wasn't in Turkheimer's original paper, but it's good to know. There's different ways of saying it, but uh, one way uh, to use a term from the book is everything, at least almost everything in psychology, is polygenic, meaning caused by many genes. There is almost no trait in psychology for which there is a single gene that makes all the difference. So take something like IQ, which as we saw last class is very heritable. There's not like a single IQ gene. Geneticists have found some genes that are some, uh, have some degree of correlation with IQ, but typically they explain less than one point. If you found a gene that was associated with 10 IQ points, you'd win a Nobel Prize, uh, but you won't. Uh, so it's lots and lots of genes contributing tiny contributions to the variance. So it's almost never uh, a single tree. Before we move on, any questions about the four laws? Yeah? Um, can you talk about understanding non-shared environment? Good. So the non-shared environment is kind of the toughest one to wrap your head around. It's all aspects of the environment that siblings don't share. And behavior genetics actually don't really have a good sense of what that is. Um, one thing it can be is peers, you know, your particular group of friends. Uh, it could be random events. Uh, it could be, it could even be things that happen to you in the womb, right? So even identical twins have a somewhat different experience in the womb. One might be taking out more space, 
uh, get hit with different nutrients or different uh, negative chemical influences. Um, all of that uh, would fall under the non-shared environment. Thank you. Um, and, and in fact, as we're going to see in a video I'm going to show in a second, in the case of peers, here's one way to think about it. Because I think the fact that the non-shared explains more than the shared, that's kind of surprising, right? You would think that the aspect of the environment that makes all the difference is like parents, like how they raise you, how they bring you up. But in fact, this explains more. But here's something to think about. Um, think about immigrants, or, or more specifically, the children of immigrants. So they're raised by people from one culture, but they grow up with peers from a different culture. Which accent do the kids almost always uh, grow up with? The accent of the parents or the peers? I mean, show of hands, how many of you have parents who were born in a different country? Um, and, and, uh, and how many of you uh, just keep your hand up if you have the accent of the parents? So not very many, right? It's pretty, it, it, almost always, kids develop with the accent of the peers, not of the parents. Um, so that's one way to think about how things other than the home environment can have a large effect. Okay, now to reinforce these, I'm gonna show a uh, video from Steven Pinker, uh, who is going to make mention of uh, all of these, except maybe the fourth one. Uh, we're gonna see some clips from his TED Talk. Steven Pinker is arguably the most important psychologist alive. I mean, you'll get different answers from different people, but he's certainly not a crazy answer to the question, uh, who's the most important psychologist alive? So, we're going to watch a, a bit of him talking about these principles. He makes reference to the idea of the blank slate, and he actually wrote a book called The Blank Slate, uh, in which he is critical of it. Uh, the blank slate being the idea uh, that the behaviorist had, namely that everything comes from uh, the environment. Okay, so that's a good summary from uh, Steven Pinker. And I like the line about uh, siblings, or about having more than one kid. Let me just ask, how many of you have siblings? Um, okay, now another show of hands. How many of you would say that your siblings are just like you? Just exactly like you? Almost none of you. Right, even though your siblings share all of the environment, they only share half of your genes. Um, now I have three younger siblings, and I can say the same, that we came out very different from day one. Uh, my mom used to say, uh, don't write the parenting book until you have more than one kid. Yeah, you think something works with the first kid, the second kid comes and is totally different, kind of from day one. Uh, Pinker has a, a, another line in another talk that he's given. He says, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, there's no evidence for that. I don't know if anyone who's studied that. In theory, it's possible that culture over the long run can be a selection pressure, which leads to genetic changes. I'd be skeptical just because particular cultural patterns are rather recent, and evolutionary change tends to take a long time. Um, you know, in the case of humans, you know, we all you know, left Africa only less than 100,000 years ago, and in evolutionary terms, that's basically nothing. Uh, it's not really enough time for uh, very significant uh, evolutionary selection pressure. So I'd be skeptical, but theoretically it's possible. Um, but I was going to say, Pinker has another uh, line on this. He says that uh, there's a technical term for people who believe that genes play no role in differences between people. The technical term for such people is childless. Because as soon as you have kids, you realize they kind of come into the world uh, different. Okay, now I want to end with uh, another caveat or, you know, just, uh, kind of some closing thoughts. Because you might think, well, law two is kind of depressing. You know, you may have thought that parenting had much more of an influence than this. And you might wonder, well, why should we bother, you know, being nice to our kids? I mean, I don't have any kids uh, uh, that I know of, but... Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that again. <laughs> more, more editing. Um, where was I? So, yes. So, uh, 
if and when we have kids, uh, why should we bother uh, with them? And there's two answers. One is that uh, there are some things for which the effect is larger than 0 to 20. As I mentioned last class, uh, for educational attainment, for example, it's somewhat more than that. Um, but additionally, I think we should just lose the illusion that parenting uh, shapes kids uh, to be who they are. And think about having a spouse. No one is under the illusion that they can fundamentally change their spouse's personality. And if you are under that illusion, you're setting yourself up for a lot of unhappiness. Uh, but no one would infer from that that, oh, then I can just be a jerk to my spouse. You should be nice to your spouse and to your children should you ever have them, because it's a human relationship. I think that that's the, uh, one of the takeaways from, uh, from behavior genetics. Another caveat that I'll make is uh, most of these studies deal with kind of normal range variation. It's still the case that you can mess your kid up. If you're talking about like extremes of abuse or malnourishment or neglect, yeah, you can mess your kid up. Uh, think about height as a possible analogy. If you starve your kid, they're going to be shorter, right? You, you can definitely harm your kid's uh, uh, growth if you malnourish them, but you're not gonna take a kid who's genetically predisposed to be short and make them 6'10". And I think the same is true for a lot of psychological traits. Okay, one more clip uh, to close out uh, the behavior genetics section. This is from a debate, a debate on is parenting overrated? Uh, it's a fun debate to watch. They cover a lot of the material that we've talked about uh, in this section. Uh, and the people on both sides of this debate are world-class experts in the area. Um, so they have a little discussion about something that's a new area of research, which is polygenic scores. Um, this is not something I'm an expert in, but we are now moving beyond the kind of twin studies, adoption studies, and actually looking directly for correlations between specific genetic variants and human behavioral differences. Um, so they have a little discussion of this. Uh, I think it's worth watching. So we'll watch that, and then we will move on to evolutionary psychology. Okay, so we'll stop there. So that was a good summing up of some of the themes we've talked about, as well as some new kind of cutting edge research um, that you don't need to know about. Uh, I will not be asking you about polygenic scores, but that's kind of where the field is moving. Now. Okay, so that's all that we have to cover for behavior genetics. Let's move on to evolutionary psychology. So one difference between behavior genetics and evolutionary psychology that I may have mentioned already is that behavior genetics is primarily, it's by definition, about human differences. Whereas evolutionary psychology is primarily about human universals, the ways in which we are all the same. Uh, there is a discussion of differences between males and females, but other than that, it's primarily about, about human universals. Um, and as I said before in chapter uh, one, you may object to evolutionary psychology on different grounds, uh, and you're free to do so. You do not need to believe anything to get a good grade in this course. You only need to understand how the paradigm works. So I want to start with a, uh, an interesting fact about life on Earth. Based on estimates I've heard, around 99% of organisms that have ever lived on Earth left no descendants today. You know, their species went extinct, or they died young, or they couldn't attract a mate, or whatever, and they left no descendants. 99%. But, not a single one of your ancestors left no descendants. Because you're here, so obviously, all of your ancestors uh, won the evolutionary game. Right? They were able to pass on their genes. One way of thinking about evolutionary psychology is this. It's about uh, the, the consequences of that fact. There are traits that we have precisely because our organisms needed those traits to pass on their genes. If they didn't have them, they lost the game. Um, I'll also do a little bit of a review. So we talked about uh, natural selection back in chapter one, but that was a while ago now. You may remember my polar bear example with my award-winning art. Uh, 
um, where you know there's uh, there's a bit uh, you know, bears have different cubs. Some of the cubs have mutations that make them have red fur or white fur or whatever. Um, and if it happens to be a snowy environment, the mutations that cause white fur will increase in frequency over time. Right? That's how natural selection works. Traits that confer a benefit on the organism increase in frequency over time because it makes the organism better at reproducing. And in order to have this, in order to have evolution occur or natural selection occur, you basically just need three ingredients. Number one, you need inheritance. You need some mechanism by which a trait can be passed on. In the case of uh, gen uh, biological evolution, that mechanism obviously is uh, DNA. Right? DNA is the mechanism of inheritance. It's the mechanism by which traits get passed on from parent to child. The second ingredient you need is variation. So you need there to be differences between uh, the traits that are getting passed on. And in evolution, the way that, that happens is mutations. Right? Occasionally there are random copying errors. Now in my polar bear example, I had one mother bear have two cubs, both with mutations. That may have been a little bit misleading. Mutations are generally rarer than that. In fact, for evolution to work, the fidelity of DNA copying has to be mostly good. But mutations can't be happening all the time or it wouldn't work. But you need some mechanism by which changes sometimes get introduced, yes. Is mutations and everything are part of natural selection and the body kind of selects like what is best for survival and that gets passed on, right? Um, More or less. Not, so it's not the body, it's um, and also, I should say, mutations and natural selections are, are different ingredients. So mutations are the uh, ingredient for uh, variation to be introduced. Natural selection is the means by which some variants win over others. And I'll just say one more thing. So as far as the body choosing, it's not the body choosing anything. It's just think of the polar bear example. So some polar bears have mutations. Or they're not polar bears yet. Some bears that first moved into Siberia. Some of them have mutations that give them white fur, and some have mutations that give them red fur or whatever. Now that's just random. The mutations just occur by accident. But natural selection means that the white bears are going to have more kids, because they're going to live longer than the red fur ones. Because in Siberia, it's covered in snow, so the deer aren't going to see the bear coming, so, whereas the, basically the red fur bear is going to starve to death, and the white fur bear is going to have more kids keep that going for a couple thousand generations, eventually all the bears have white fur. So my follow-up question was going to be like, if something is best for survival, that's kind of how it continues to get passed on. How can certain mutations that cause illnesses and everything, those end up getting passed on to generations and stuff? Oh, good question. So um, there's different possibilities there. One is just that natural selection is not perfect. I mean, you can almost think of it as a filter, right? It filters out certain traits, but look, if the organism has, has some bad traits, but it lives long enough to mate and have kids, it can still get passed on, right? Now, in some cases, it may be that genes that increase your risk of certain diseases also increase your risk of certain risk quote of certain benefits. So there's some argument that uh, traits like schizophrenia or bipolar, which are both very heritable, that the same genes that predispose some people to being at risk for schizophrenia can also put you, uh, can make you more creative or, or whatever. So it's, it's again because it's polygenic? Yeah, that, you can think of it that way too. Uh, good questions. Um, okay, so that's uh, how variation is introduced. And then the third ingredient is uh, differential reproductive success. I'm just gonna write R-E-P, reproductive uh, success. Meaning, some organisms are better at passing on their genes than others. And that's the, that's the means by which natural selection occurs, right? Some traits get passed on more. Now, I'll note in passing, theoretically, these same ingredients could uh, make natural selection occur, even for non-genetic inheritance. 
How many of you know the term meme? I assume all of you. No, you don't know what a meme is? M-E-M-E? -E? Oh, meme. Yeah, meme, yeah. Um, now, most of you probably know the, does anyone know, there's a scientific sense of this word too. It was actually introduced by a biologist named Richard Dawkins before the internet ruined it. Um, but uh, in Dawkins' sense of the term, he wanted to argue that it's possible for these same steps to occur even for non-biological uh, replication. So what a meme is, is it's a unit of, uh, you could say, ideas or behavioral patterns. It's something that humans pass on, not genetically, but by sharing them with people or by imitation. So it could be like uh, a particular idea, a particular fashion style, or whatever. It's supposed to be like a gene, right, where a gene is a unit of inheritance in biology. This is a unit of uh, uh, transmission and cultural transmission. And the idea is theoretically, you could get natural selection with this too, right? Uh, ideas are passed on from person to person, and some of those ideas are better at getting themselves passed on uh, than others, and this can lead to a kind of natural selection. Now, it's controversial whether the analogy works and whether this could actually be a way to study culture scientifically, but I just mentioned that as uh, maybe a way to understand how natural selection works. It's, it's just the idea that some things are better at getting themselves passed on uh, than others. Any questions about natural selection? Okay. Uh, a very important distinction uh, that will help you, and this actually partly gets to one of the questions we got. Uh, it's very important to understand that there's a difference between two types of products that evolution gives you. Adaptations and byproducts. And here's the difference. An adaptation is a trait that was produced by natural selection, or selected for by natural selection, because of the reproductive benefit that it conferred. So I'll say again, it's a trait that was uh, selected for by natural selection because of the benefit that it conferred. So to pick an example, um, you know, color vision, right? It's something that primates and some other animals have. Uh, this was selected for because it helped us see snakes and find food and distinguish things. Uh, and, th and so that's an advantage to have, so it was selected for by evolution. Another example in the case of humans is the umbilical cord, right? This is something that uh, is adapted for people to be able to produce because it allows the mother to feed the child while it's in the womb, uh, which is adaptive. A byproduct is a side effect of an adaptation that does not have any advantage in itself. It just comes along for free. So for example, in the case of the umbilical cord, one side effect of having an umbilical cord is you get a belly button once you're up out of the womb. At least most of the time. I, I had a, uh, a gay friend who once was um, uh, with uh, someone uh, who did not have a belly button. Apparently, theoretically, you cannot have, but most people have them, uh, and they're just a byproduct. They don't have any function, they're not there to gather food or attract mates, or they're just a side effect of something that is an adaptation, namely the umbilical cord. This is important to keep in mind because evolutionary psychologists do not believe that everything about us is adaptive. Some things might just be byproducts. They might just be side effects of things that are adaptive. Uh, one example, uh, it's been argued by some, and this is controversial, but some have argued that our ability to like music is a byproduct. So we have the ability to respond emotionally to certain sounds. So if a noise is very deep, uh, that makes it scary, it kind of makes our hair stand up, because the larger an entity is, uh, the deeper the, the noise is. Right? Lions have louder 
or um, uh, deeper voices than uh, kittens do. Uh, we also are designed to kind of respond with concern if we hear a baby crying. Right? So, so our emotions are kind of tuned to respond differently to different sounds. And it could be that music just kind of acts on that. Right? So our ability to like music may not have been selected for, it might just be a side effect of other adaptations that we have, like the ability to emotionally respond to sound. Okay, does that distinction make sense? Does anyone have a question about these two terms? Yeah? Does the appendix be considered an adaptation of byproduct? Because I don't think we really have a use for it anymore, but it's still in our bodies. Good, that's something else. That would be something that's vestigial. Uh, you don't need to know that term. So it's a term that was originally an adaptation, uh, but no longer is. Now there's some debate. Apparently the Appendix has some immune function that still remains, but you can live without it. Um, but yes, theoretically, you can have traits that were originally adaptations, but no longer help us. Uh, that would that would be something else, I guess. Uh, but good question. Okay. Uh, the book has a little discussion of kind of the history of evolution and kind of different uh, steps in the in the in our divergence from chimpanzees. A lot of that's probably review. The only thing I'll say because the picture is a little bit misleading. So here's how it works. So we, you know, if you think of the evolutionary line, we split from chimps around seven million years ago. And sometimes people think, okay, it's just like a linear progression from the common ancestor to us. But really, it's more like this. Um, there are lots of branches uh, off from that original branching away from the common ancestor with chimps, and some of them actually coexisted with Homo sapiens for a long time. So for example, Homo erectus, which is a more, quote, primitive uh, version, actually coexisted with modern humans for a while. Uh, so did the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals coexisted with us uh, until a few tens of thousands of years ago, Part of the reason we know they coexisted with us is apparently some Homo sapiens mated with them, and we still have uh, the genes. There was apparently some funny business going on uh, between the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens. Um, but anyways, that, that's just a clarification because the picture in the book is a little bit, a little bit misleading in that regard. Okay. The next distinction that I'm going to talk about is the distinction between two types of adaptations. So remember, I just finished saying that an adaptation is a trait uh, that is selected for because of the advantage it confers. But evolutionary theorists distinguish between domain-specific adaptations and domain-general adaptations. Now this line is not sharp, it's kind of a matter of degree, but it's good to have a rough sense of the difference. A domain-specific adaptation is something that is very tailor-made for one kind of function. So the ability to see red, you know, that would be a very domain-specific adaptation. Uh, the ability to find a mate or um, you know, traits like that, or th those would be more domain specific. Something that might be more domain general might be uh, the ability to learn, right? The ability to learn from experience. So think about uh, uh, reward and punishment, right? Like operant condition. If you do something and it causes pain, you don't do it anymore. Now that applies to all kinds of cases, right? It applies to social situations, physical pain, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's a more, the capacity to learn from punishment or reward is a very domain general ability. Whereas something like the ability to see red is more narrow and uh, uh, domain specific. And one debate, ongoing debate in psychology, is how many of these adaptations do we have? So the evolutionary psychologists tend to say that the human mind is like a Swiss army knife. How many of you guys know what a Swiss Army knife is, right? Like the knife with like the knife and the fork and the magnifying glass and the tweezers, you know, whatever, right? It's got a bunch of tools in it. And 
Evolutionary psychologists think that our mind is like that. We have lots of domain-specific abilities that were designed by evolution. Whereas uh, certain cognitive people, and definitely the behaviorists, think that we have more so domain general adaptations. So like the behaviorists, I'm caricaturing them a little bit, but they basically think we have one domain general adaptation, the ability to be conditioned. And everything else we have kind of emerges from that. Right? We come in with not very much uh, specificity given to us by evolution. Now, I'm, we're going to do a little game. This is uh, one type of experiment the Ebb site people use to argue that we have more domain-specific adaptations. So I have here uh, four cue cards. And we're going to do a little game with them. So I'm going to write out uh, two statements about these cue cards. One of them is true, I'm going to tell you it's true. The other one may or may not be. So the first statement is, every card has a um, letter on one side and a number on the other side. Okay? Uh, not always the same side, but each one has one of each. So that is true. I'm telling you now, I, I'm not lying to you, this is true. But here's something that may or may not be true. If there is an even number, or sorry, that's no, that. If there is a vowel on one side, then there is an even number on the other side. Okay? That's the a uh, statement that may or may not be true. Yes? By the way, uh, is the number just one digit or just however many? Uh, it's always one digit, yeah. So it's always one letter and one digit, zero to nine. So here's what the cards are. A, this is the side facing up. D, four, and seven. So here's the question. Which cards do you have to flip over to figure out if two is true? Don't say it out loud, we're gonna do a little poll. So again, the rule is, if there's a vowel on one side, either side, then there's an even number on the other side. So think about which ones we have to flip. Do we have to flip A? Show of hands. Okay. Show of hands, do we have to flip D? Show of hands, do we have to flip 4? Show of hands, do we have to flip 7? Okay. Congrats to everyone who said A and 7. That is the correct answer. This is a very typical class, though. This is a, it's kind of a trap. So A is, is correct, and that's sort of obvious, right? If there's a vowel on one side, there's an even number on the other, okay, obviously we have to flip A. D, almost no one put, said D. Like, okay, no matter what is on the other side, it's irrelevant to the rule. If it's an even number, cool. If it's an odd number, doesn't matter. Now let's think about four for a second. Suppose we flip it over and it's a, it's a vowel. Okay, great, that, that's, that's fine. But what if it's a consonant? Does that matter? No, because the rule is if there's a vowel, then there's an even number. It's not if there's an even number, then there's a vowel. So four is irrelevant. Now what about seven? If we flip over seven and there's a vowel, well now the rule's wrong. So you have to flip seven too. And don't worry, I got this wrong when I first saw this too. It's, it's, it's a difficult logical uh, puzzle. So most people get this wrong. Most people say A and four, just like this class did. Okay, now we're gonna do a different version with different cards. So now, it's not uh, a letter and a number. It's, uh, each card has an, uh, an age and a beverage. 
So these cards correspond to, uh, to people. So each card has uh, an age and a beverage. The beverage will either be uh, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And here's the rule uh, that, that may or may not be true. Uh, if the person is uh, older than uh, 18, or the other way, if the person is under 18, it is a non-alcoholic beverage, right? So this is the rule in you know most societies. Uh, or in Vancouver, it's, or in BC, it's 19, and states it's 21, but we'll stick with the Alberta one. So the rule is, you can't have alcohol if you're under 18. So we're gonna try and check who's following the rule. So one is beer, so the person in question has beer. One is Coke. Now over here we're gonna have some ages. So one is 35, and one is uh, 16. Okay, so we wanna check to see if they're following the rule. Who thinks we have to, so remember, it's, it's beverage and age on either side. Who thinks we have to flip over the beer? Joe Hans. See if they're following, who thinks we have to flip over uh, the Coke? Who thinks we have to flip over uh, the 35 year old? Who thinks we have to flip over the 16 year old? Right, so the right answer in this case is beer and 16. And as you can see, many, much more people got that correct. Now if you think about it, that's kind of weird because if, if you go home and think about these two examples, the logic is exactly the same. It's just with beer instead of vowel. Why is this so much easier? The evolutionary psychology answer is that we have a domain-specific adaptation, or what evolutionary psychologists call a module. This is a term that occurs a lot in the book. A module is kind of a mental domain-specific adaptation, and they think we have one for cheater detection. They think that our brains are very well designed to detect when people are breaking the rules. And you might think, well, isn't it just that it's a social thing, not just that it's about rules? But they've done some really clever experiments uh, seeming to show that people are especially good when it's about breaking the rules, not only when it's about social information in general. Um, now, there's some controversy about this. I'm not saying this is the settled view, but this is the kind of argument that an evolutionary psychologist would, would make to argue that we have domain-specific adaptations. Because if it's just domain general abilities to reason about things, then these problems should be equally easy. But as we, as we just saw, uh, the rule one, the social rule one, is much, much easier. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? Yeah, a module is just a domain-specific adaptation, but a mental one. So not like a foot or something, something in the mind. The book then has a discussion of kind of the history of evolutionary psychology. So arguably the first evolutionary psychologist was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin did write about how evolution could be relevant to how humans think and behave. Uh, he wrote a book on uh, the evolution of emotion, for example. Um, but the modern incarnation uh, began in the 1990s with uh, John Tooby and Lita Cosmides. Um, and it remains a controversial area in psychology. Uh, here's a true story about this. Um, so I uh, was supervised in Georgia State University by someone who was educated at UC Santa Barbara, which is uh, where uh, Cosmos and Tubi are today. And I was applying to UC Santa Barbara, and this professor asked me, okay, so Cosmos and Tubi are evolutionary psych people. Have you drank the Kool-Aid? And I was like, Probably shouldn't say it like that, but, uh, and what I said was, 
I drank about 70% of it. Yeah, so. uh, and I didn't get in. Maybe he wrote the letter slightly less good for that place. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but the fact that he put it that way is indicative of the fact that it still is a controversial area. There still are critics of Ebsyche, and they are not all crazy. There are legitimate criticisms to put forward. Um, and as I say, all, all you're required to do is to understand how the paradigm works. Now, on page 126 and 7, there's a section on the evolutionary uh, psychology of personality. We're not going to worry about that. It's kind of interesting if you want to read about it, but uh, I once took an entire course on evolutionary psychology. There was nothing about this in there. It's a very minor area, um, and I, I don't think you really need to, to worry about that. So uh, we'll move on to the section on uh, mating sections, sections, mating systems, and parental investment. So from an evolutionary point of view, the function of uh, mating or sexual desire is to get your genes passed on. Um, <laughs> I was once talking with someone, and I asked them, you know, why do you think sex feels good? Like, what do you think the function of it is? And they said, oh, I think it feels good because it's good exercise. <laughs> There's no way that's true. And if you think that's true, here's something to do. If you have a partner, uh, try like rubbing your elbows together very vigorously, or your knees or something. I guarantee you, <laughs> it will not feel good, right? Obviously, um, there's something special about uh, the way sex feels because it facilitates reproduction. Any organism that had no sexual desire at all would have been much less likely, obviously, to have their genes passed on. Now, some people, of course, are asexual for various reasons, but uh, by and large, the evolutionary tendency is to enjoy sex, because again, anyone who didn't probably didn't leave uh, very many descendants. Um, and before I go into this in more detail, I'm gonna make another important distinction. And that's the distinction between proximate explanation or proximate causation and ultimate causation. And ultimate here basically means uh, evolutionary. But it, the word ult ultimate is sometimes used in the literature, so it's good to know. These are not in the book, uh, but they will help you understand what's going on. So proximate explanation is about why someone is doing a certain thing in kind of the, it's about all the causes in the immediate environment and in their immediate kind of biology. So suppose Bob is asking Susan out on a date. And you ask Bob, or you're asking as a scientist, why did Bob just do that? If you give a proximate explanation, you'll say things like, his hormones are doing this, or there's something in the environment, or Susan's wearing a shirt that he likes, or whatever, you know, something like that, something in the immediate context. But if you're asking about ultimate explanation, you ask, well, why do people have a tendency to do that sort of thing at all? What's the evolutionary basis for uh, romantic or sexual desire? And there, the answer is going to be what I just said earlier, right? People who had a genetic tendency to do that sort of thing, were more likely to pass on their genes. And it's important to make this distinction because I will speak about people doing X, Y, Z because it was evolutionarily adapted. But that doesn't mean they're consciously thinking, yes, I should ask Susan out because it will increase my genetic fitness. No one thinks like that. I mean, maybe some people do, but no normal person thinks like that. Um, because that's what they're immediately thinking about, that's a part of proximate causation. When we talk about evolutionary psychology, we're asking about ultimate causation. So if you don't get those confused, uh, this chapter will make a lot more sense. Or, any questions before I erase this? Yes. Yeah, pretty much ultimate causes proximate um, explanation. Not always, <laughs> because proximate causation could include environmental causes. But in the case of biological proximate causes, then yes. Any other questions? Okay. 
So uh, it's not only the case that uh, evolution can explain uh, the fact that we have sexual desire or uh, that sort of thing, but also specific facts about the way sexual desire works. And probably the uh, theory that has been most influential in this area is parental investment theory. The book has a good uh, discussion of this. This theory was put forward to explain differences between men and women. Uh, in uh, a variety of, of, uh, of areas. So here's an interesting question to think about. Why are men larger than women on average? This is true not just in humans, but in virtually all mammalian species. Males are larger than females on average. And the parental investment answer essentially boils down to because the males have smaller gametes smaller sex cells. You might think, what the hell does that have to do with how big they are? And here's the basic idea. It'll take me a while actually to get it back to uh, the size difference, but there is an answer. So parental, parental investment is about what's the minimum amount of investment you need to make in an offspring in order for it to be viable. And in virtually all mammalian species, there is a large difference in the minimum amount of investment required for the offspring to be able to survive and reproduce itself. For males, or for, for females, uh, the minimum investment varies from species, but in humans it's nine months, right? In order to, and really more than that, because in the ancestral environment you would have had to breastfed as well. Today you don't necessarily have to, but in the savanna of Africa where we evolved, if the kid is gonna have a chance to survive, you have to breastfeed uh, the kid. So really it's probably a year or two uh, is the minimum amount of investment that a female has to make in order for the kid to survive. What's the minimum amount of investment a male needs to make in order for the kid to survive? About three minutes. Exactly, yes. Um, and if you're younger, maybe less than that, right? So, you know, uh, not very much. Now, it so happens in the case of humans that males typically invest more than that, and that's going to be relevant later, but the minimum is obviously much less. What this leads to is different selection pressures uh, for males and females. For females, there is selection pressure to be more choosy, especially for casual sexual encounters, right? Because a female can only have one offspring every year or two, right? Uh, so it better be some good genes. You better show me that I'm not wasting my year on someone with idiot genes, right? Uh, whereas for a male, uh, the male is free to have many uh, offspring in a given year. There's, uh, as Paul Bloom will say later, virtually no limit to how many descendants a male can have. This means that females are the scarce resource that get competed for in, in evolutionary terms. For males, there will be selection pressure for them to desire more kind of casual sexual encounters and more selection pressure for females to be more choosy because it's more of a... Uh, investment in evolutionary terms. Uh, yes? Two things. Does that, the gametes mean that the men just have less instructions about what to do with the child, basically, or like what's... Yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't have started with that. Really, it's, it's reflective of the fact that uh, sexual encounter is cheap for a man. Like you, it, it, you're not risking years of commitment uh, to the kid. Uh, in theory, it can be as someone said, uh, a few minutes. And, uh, sorry, another thing. Oh, How yes. does that work with like bears or smaller bears are notorious for like keeping their kids and stuff? How, how does um, that become? I don't know about bears. Uh, in the case of lions, I know they only eat cubs if it's from a previous male. Do uh, uh, male bears eat their own cubs? I think so. Oh, okay. I don't know. Bears are fucked. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. I'm sure there's some answers. I, I think the explanation was like, oh, if the male bears are going to be competition when they grow up. Oh, so they only eat the male? I'm pretty, I, I'm oh, interesting. Sure on the details, but, yeah. I'll, I'll look into that. It's an interesting question. Yes. Uh, there's also like the case with pandas. Like they'll have, if they have more than one kid, like they just like neglect the other kid and just like let it die or like sometimes they roll over on it and like suck 
Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it could be that maybe they, they think 1K is a better investment. Maybe 1K is looking like not as promising. But I don't know about the panda case either. So I know more about humans. Who cares about pandas? Well, you know, pandas are sort of cool. Um, okay. Now, here's one study. This is the single funniest study ever done in psychology, in my opinion. And there's, there's some good ones, but this one takes the cake. So I finished saying that parental investment theory predicts that males will be less choosy about casual sexual encounters. Now, for uh, in the case of humans, males typically do invest more than that. Uh, humans are a pair bonding species in which men and women often uh, cooperate to raise a kid. But in the case of casual sexual encounters, we would predict, based on this, that males will be less choosy. So how does the prediction turn out? Well, believe it or not, uh, a group of researchers did uh, the following study. They sent out a group of attractive males and attractive females into a university campus and told them to approach random people and ask them one of the following three questions. So first they would come up and say, hello, you know, my name is so-and-so, I've been seeing you around campus, I find you very attractive, would you like to uh, go to dinner with me? They'd ask some people that. Would you like to go back to my apartment, or would you like to go to bed with me? You would probably not get away with doing this study today, but this is back in the Wild West days of psychology. And then what they did was they just crunched the numbers. Just looked at what the responses were. So for women, being approached by random dudes, for uh, dinner, 50% uh, said yes. You know, these are good-looking guys. You know, 50% is not bad. Uh, so that's what the response was there. For apartment, uh, it was uh, less than 10%. So yes to that. And for will you go to bed with me, uh, literally zero. Not a, not, a, not a single woman said yes. Well, come on, you gotta, you gotta get to know me first. Yeah. Um, for men? 50% said yes to dinner, so for uh, something that could potentially be serious, men and women are uh, equally picky. Over 60% and 75% This is the largest effect size that I know of in psychology. Um, I really have nothing more to say. <laughs> um, I was... I was once uh, uh, seeing a girl, and at the same time I was working uh, construction, so I was working like uh, concrete coating and polishing, and men who work construction are a different breed of characters, right? They're a little vulgar, you know, there's a lot of cussing out. And I once made the mistake of uh, sharing with the girl I was seeing what one of the guys at work had said. And let's just say it wasn't a very polite thing to say. Uh, and she was like, that's terrible. You know, men shouldn't speak that way of, of, about women or whatever. And I said, oh, you know, you're probably right. But I'm sure when you're with your girlfriends, you know, you probably say, like, men are pigs or whatever. And she said, no, that's different. That's okay, because men are pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess she may have had a point. <laughs> okay. And as I was, was going to say, this is obviously exactly what you would predict on the basis of parental uh, investment theory, namely that females would be more choosy about casual sexual encounters. Oh, and then yes, oh, and one final thing about this study, because the study, it's such, it's such good fun. So at the end, they included quotes from the men and women who were approached. And the women who were approached for the third thing uh, said things like, what is wrong with you? Why don't you get away from me? And the men said things like, why would we wait until tonight? <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Is there a measurable number for this between men and women? Yeah, I mean, there are cross-cultural kind of anthropological studies on how much time mothers and fathers spend with children. Um, as far as a measure of mental, do you mean like how much they care for the kid or how close they are with the kid? Well, I know that there is a, a sociological answer, we just talked about this yesterday, a 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know I know about the study you're talking about is Harry Harlow. We talk about it in chapter 12. Uh, it's a very important study. But yeah, I don't know a way to measure mental investment. But if you use behavioral measures, you do tend to find that women spend more time with the kid and so on. Um, and by the way, look, there are obviously sociological reasons for that too. And probably sociological contributions even to this difference, right? Men and women are socialized differently as well. But I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the pattern. There probably is some biological underpinning. Uh, as well. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Uh, one other prediction that follows from parental investment theory has to do with uh, species in which the males get pregnant. So there are some species, like certain seahorses, for example, in which the males have like a sperm pouch or something. I forget exactly how it works, but they're the ones who have more parental investment. And the prediction of parental investment theory is that in those species, the females should be larger and compete more for sex and be more uh, aggressive. And this prediction is confirmed. This is, in fact, exactly what you find. Uh, people sometimes criticize evolutionary psychology for not making predictions. Uh, and there are some predictions you can make. That would be one example where you make a cross-species prediction. Yes? Um, not primarily. Typically the reason, for, I guess I forgot to get back to that, the reason for the size difference in mammals is mostly for male-male competition, because males compete for mates. Um, and as we're going to see, maybe next class we may not have time, but uh, in species that are more polygynous, in which males have more female partners, there is a larger size difference. So like for elephant seals, one male elephant seal can have a harem of like 60 females. And the males are five times bigger than the females because they fight each other for access to females. And because the stakes are so much higher, there's a huge size difference. Yes, sir. Okay, so you mentioned how like, there's like certain seahorses where like the men are in the and the males are in the babies. So like, what's that like? What's that like they're classifying male and female? Because I thought like for any like species, right? Like the females are like very similar. Good, good question. So, uh, in most species that's true, but the way that males and females are defined in biology is by the size of the gametes. So males make small gametes, right, sperm or other gametes and other organisms, and females make the large gametes. In the seahorse, it so happens that the one with the small gametes also is the one who carries the child. Okay, one final uh, example of a prediction that follows from this uh, has to do with sexual jealousy. This will be probably the last thing I talk about. So, as my professor once said, when a husband and wife are in the, um, in the hospital and the female is giving birth, the wife knows that's her kid. The man, he hopes. Um, <laughs> So this is a, leads to an interesting uh, theory, which is that uh, males will be more concerned with sexual infidelity than females will be. Obviously, both don't like it, but the theory is that males will be especially uh, sexually jealous. Because the big risk to them, in evolutionary terms, is if they wind up raising another man's kid, which is kind of a waste in evolutionary terms. Not, not in moral terms, but just kind of from the gene's eye view. Whereas the prediction is that for women, uh, what they are scared of is the man investing his resources elsewhere. Because in our evolutionary past, men and women tended to both invest in the kid. Uh, because uh, women are somewhat more vulnerable when they're pregnant and when they're breastfeeding. So it's uh, evolutionarily adaptive to have a man who will stick around. And so if there's any evidence that the man is kind of spending more time with someone else or maybe falling in love with someone else, that is a, a threat 
uh, in evolutionary terms. And so the, the prediction that evolutionary psychologists like David Buss made was that uh, males would be more jealous of sexual infidelity and females would be more jealous than males of emotional infidelity. And you find that both are jealous of both, obviously, but there is a difference in that predicted direction. This is another example of how evolutionary psychology can be used uh, to make predictions that are testable. Uh, and we will stop there. So we'll get started here next class. Uh, see you all. Then.